As long as I've been associated with farms, I never cease to be amazed by the cycle of life. It ebbs and flows. It can be thrilling, it can be heartbreaking, often at the same time. So why don't we take a look at a slice of farm life? I know this little guy's excited about it. Just calm down, it's gonna be okay. Ducks are a lot of fun to have around. And I've got several breeds here, really just to illustrate some great breeds for just a very small home flock. Now this is one of my favorites. Oh, you're so cute. This is a white crested. It's actually sort of a pecan. We've got a big white pecan drake here on the farm, but this one has a gene that produces this funny little top knot, which looks like an Easter bonnet, I think, or a mohawk. She's got a mohawk hairdo. But anyway, they're really cute to have around. And just three or four of them in the backyard. They'll eat a lot of insects, they'll lay eggs. But of these, this one is not particularly the best egg layer, but to me, they're one of the most amusing. Let's go find another breed and let me describe it. Okay, go on, go on, go on. Go on. Now this is actually a young mallard, again, very young, five weeks old. Look at all the feathers she's already put out. What a beautiful breast. And uh, this is a wild mallard. The parentage of these ducks comes from the, the Peabody mallard. So while it's a wild mallard, they've been domesticated and they enjoy very plush accommodations at the Peabody Hotel. What's interesting is that most domestic ducks that we have today originally derive from the mallard. Okay, okay, go on, calm down, go, go, go. This is a black kuaga, um, beautiful duck. Black bill, black eyes, black down, black feathers. You can see the feathers are beginning to come out. I know, I know, I know. You're getting so big. They make a beautiful, beautiful duck. The, the feathers are almost green. They're so black. And they also lay an almost black egg as well, a very dark egg. Okay, go join the others. Craig, you know we both believe in the conservation of poultry, but in your opinion, what are some of the main reasons that you feel like that these great old heritage birds should be conserved? Well, for one thing, uh, these are a far superior bird, and some of the older breeds might even be better, for home usage. Mm -hmm. uh, for the backyard one, flock. For backyard flock. For one thing. He agrees. <laughs> he does. They lend themselves to home production uh, with natural methods. You can't do that with the modern commercial hybrids. Sure. And we don't know what the future holds. We have taken the commercial meat birds to the point where some of them, instead of being F1 hybrids, are F38s or even F40s or 41s. Right. So there's a genetic component here there's that, a genetic that cries component. for conservation. Right, but you save breeds like the dot you can go back to the well. Sure, sure. Uh, in less than, well, not much more than 50 years, we've gone from where there were more than 200 breeds and varieties in fairly common agricultural use to where there's less than a dozen types. Mm, right. And uh, you don't want to cut off all those stems and not be able to use them in the future. Well, we're seeing this across the board with, with, with plants and food crops. Exactly. They're, they've just been narrowed down to and, just a few. And other livestock. Yes. Uh, a lot of them have just about disappeared. And Craig, 
you know, that's a that's a great lead in to, to the flavor of these birds because there's a lot of diversity in, in the that's flavor correct. of these different breeds. Uh, that's right, and I think we're gonna see more interest from chefs and just home cooks mm -hmm. in quality product. Right. Uh, everything in the last 50 years has been about production and volume, volume not about uh, quality. And differentiation of texture and flavor and That's so forth. That's right. Yeah. I guess another reason for me personally, Craig, for saving these breeds is they're just beautiful. Oh, they absolutely are. And today, all the commercial chickens are white. Well, there That's are- That's no fun if you're trying to plant a beautiful barnyard garden of flowers through poultry. <laughs> That's exactly right. It's not only no fun, uh, there are advantages. This bird is less uh, likely to be picked up by a hawk than a white bird, <laughs> right. which stands out. A good out. practical point. <laughs> a good practical point. Craig, all these are great points, and it's just a real honor to have the president of the uh, Society for the Preservation of Poultry Antiquities right here on Moss Mountain Farm. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Alan, and it's always nice to spend time with a life member. Oh, you're very kind. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Unfortunately, chickens are regarded really as just food. Sorry about that. But a friend of mine, Dean Norton, director of horticulture at Mount Vernon, and I both think differently. We think these guys ought to be saved. Dean, it's great having you here at Moss Mountain Farm. Thank you very much, great to be here. Well, you know, I'm so inspired by what you all have done at George Washington's Mount Vernon with the landscape. Yeah, it's really special. You know, for the last 20 years, we've really been concentrating on all areas of the landscape. And, and probably the most recent restoration is, has been the Upper Garden. Uh, five years of archaeology, a lot of written research. It's fabulous. It's just beautiful. Well, the, what's interesting, too, about Mount Vernon is you all have moved out into the broader landscape, and, and you're now showcasing some of the heritage livestock. Right. Since about 1990, we started an interpretive program and have, have really helped uh, preserve and uh, conserve three breeds, the Milking Red Devon Cow, the Ossaba Island Hog, and the Hog Island Sheep. Well, take a look at some of these Dorkings. These would have been a, a breed, as you know, that um, Washington would have, would have known. Oh, they're beautiful. Yeah, these are great. Now, these, you, you all have had some of these at Mount Vernon before, I think. We, we have. Uh, you know, chickens have been kind of tough for us in that um, we have a lot of animals that eat them. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's tough being a chicken. It's tough you know, being a chicken. Wants to eat you. Yeah, yeah. But. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of interest about conservation of breeds, these older breeds. But with our farm complex, our farm system the way it is, I mean, it's very efficient. Why, why bother with these breeds? I like the analogy of what we're trying to do with these heritage breeds as if you're looking at your stock portfolio. I mean, your financial advisor is always telling you to diversify, right? Yeah, that's it. Well, the way it is now, all these farms are, are using specialized breeds. Right, it's one genotype. That's exactly right. Narrow genotype. And if you lose that, you've lost it all. Yeah. But by diversifying our gen genetic portfolio, we're, our agricultural future is going to be much stronger. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think genetic conservation is one of the reasons I've gotten so into trying to preserve these poultry lines, and it's great that places like Mount Vernon are preserving some of the mammalian lines. Uh, no question. I mean, it's so exciting to know that we had one of the last breeding pairs of Ossaba Island hogs. Uh, a very rare breed. I didn't and, know that. Yeah, and, and what was really interesting was that Bermuda had wild hogs and it actually helped save a, a ship that wrecked there many years ago and we helped them reintroduce uh, those hogs back to Bermuda. So there's reciprocity going on. Uh, definitely. So as what you're doing, sharing your breeds with others, sure. we're doing the same. Satellite, satellite flocks and breeds uh, um, elsewhere so that it continues to grow and continue to, to increase that gene pool.
Well, a lot of the animals that, that the early Americans got were actually had been, they had been deposited by Spaniard and Portuguese explorers yeah. dropping uh, breeding pairs off on barrier islands. Right. So the Oswald Island hogs come from uh, an island off the coast of Georgia, uh, hog island off the coast of the eastern shore. So, um, you know, we're looking out there and go, there's a pig out there yeah. or there's sheep and they, we brought them on in. The great thing about the breeds is they were very hardy and, and, yeah. and they could withstand a lot of Great them. land race breeds. Exactly. So, Dean, they would deposit these pairs on these islands because they knew they could come back exactly. as a food source. Their hope was that they would reproduce. And they didn't have to bring the animals the next time around. Yeah, they'd, they'd be going to a food source. Exactly. Very good. Yep. Interesting. Well, in terms of sharing, one day I hope to share some of these dorkings with Mount Vernon. That would be fan fabulous, really. It would be great to have them back. Uh, that's what they're here for. Cool. Oh, wonderful. <laughs>
in the weather that we also have in the conditions. I mean, Missouri is a pretty tough climate. Sometimes the year it's really hot in the summer, it's really cold in the winter. And so they have to be able to fit in both those scenarios and do well in both of them. Harley, I know you're crazy about growing all kinds of fruit, just like I am. You know, I try to get as many folks interested in growing some apples and pears and peaches or whatever in their home gardens. And one of the big questions, I think, is pollination. How many trees should I have? Can, do I need two of one variety or two of two different varieties? What's your take on it? You pose an excellent question. And the truth is it varies with the species and the variety. Most Japanese plums, for example, there's only one called methylene that we carry across the south that's self-fruitful. Everything else takes two different varieties. Right. Apples are self-incompatible. Mm. So with apples, except crab apples, crab apples have that tendency to be self-fruitful. I see. They but can pollinate they, themselves, yes, in other words. Yes, and so. they can also pollinate the standard apple trees. Well, and that's why we have this tree here. I planted 14 of these. This is, as you know, prairie fire. Yep. It's an old variety. Old one, very nice. And it has a beautiful pink bloom on it. And I planted it because I thought it would help our fruit set with all our other apples. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then, of course, uh, you've got the sort of natural pollination, but then we, we love the help we can get from our friends, the insects. They are pollinating today, I can tell you, because I have some early blueberries. Well, any warm day, those bees are out working the flowers. They love them. Yeah. They really, and they, they, but we also have some of the native mason bees. We have the little blueberry, the, what's called the uh, blueberry bee, and we have the bumblebees. And believe it or not, even a carpenter bee that messes with your house and does all that bad stuff. <laughs> They'll do a little pollinating They as will well. do a little pollinating. <laughs> That's sure great. And, and what the homeowner, I think, needs to understand is if there are hives in your vicinity, typically those bees will find your, your fruit trees. That's very true. Yeah, you don't have to keep hives in your backyard for your fruit trees. That's right. Yeah. And, and that's one reason uh, if you're using any type of pesticide, you're very careful during that pollination period, during that flowering period right. to, to not use those. And if you've got a little extra space, always be careful about tearing up all the wild area because that's where your native bees live. Mm, yes. So those are things that need to be considerations for people who maybe don't have enough honeybees. Harley, it's a pleasure to have you here at the farm. It is wonderful to be here. Fantastic view. Your orchard you're developing uh, will be a real addition to this place. Well, I, I thank you so much for your expertise. Ah, thank you. Hey, it's spring and the asparagus is waking up. It's that time of year when my asparagus is really showing out. Now this particular bed is one that I planted about three years ago, and it's really producing a lot of asparagus, even though during the winter, I didn't put down any fertilizer on it, which I like to do. You know, in that January, February phase, when the fertilizer could sort of sink in around the roots and when it wakes up, it would have plenty of food. But nonetheless, it's producing a lot. This particular variety is called Purple Passion. And it's called that because if you look at the stems, they're really purple. And if you compare it to other asparagus varieties, you can see the redness come through in the stalks of this particular variety. You can see there's some nice stems of it coming up over there. And you can see these really tall ones. This will make a really sort of ethereal, light hedge almost of foliage. And it's important when you grow asparagus that you not take all of the spears particularly in the beginning, because what you want is you want enough spears to come up and produce foliage, and that foliage through photosynthesis will build starches in the plant, and then you get a bigger crop the next year. So if we walk back here, you can see that I've got several that I can harvest back here that are just kind of waking up, and just look at the size of some of these stalks. They're just beautiful. You see, you want to cut them off while they're really tender, and, um, and then you want to save some, for instance, Look here, I left a lot in this clump and you can even see last year's stalks where they were cut. And um, earlier in the week I was in here and took some off at this level. And sometimes I'll take tender stalks like this, you know, at about this level they're still very tender and edible. 
So I'll clip them off. And what will happen is off these side shoots will be another limb that'll come up and that'll stay there all summer. And as I mentioned before, re-energize the plant. Now in the past, I've talked to you about how to cut back asparagus in the winter and how to fertilize it as well as planting asparagus. It's a great vegetable to have, and one of the things that you need to realize is that it will last for a long time. Like I said, this bed has been here for years, and it will be here for years to come. Hey, trust me on this one. Grow some of your own asparagus. You're gonna love it, and it's good for you. Do you ever wonder what's just below the surface of soil? Some people call this dirt, but I prefer to call it soil. Soil is very important to me because it's really what makes all of this grow in my gardens. And there's so much complexity to soil. To me, that's fascinating. In fact, it's its own little ecosystem. It's full of all kinds of microbes and insects. The more we know about it, the better plants we can grow. First things first, to understand soil, you have to look at it in layers or horizons. You see there are six commonly recognized master layers which go all the way down to the actual bedrock. But for today, let's just focus on the top two. First is the organic matter that is deposited on the surface. This is usually made up of plant and animal residue. This blankets all of the horizons of the soil, protecting from erosion and feeding the layers below. The next layer is what we know as topsoil. This layer is where the most biological activity occurs, housing earthworms, arthropods, nematodes, fungi, and microorganisms, among the minerals and decomposed organic matter. As you can imagine, this layer is the primary source of nutrients for your plants making it the most important to understand for your garden's success. You know, recognizing the composition of your soil can tell you a lot about how certain plants will do in your garden. If you find that your soil, after testing, is deficient of certain things, it can often be easily amended. You see, I think using natural fertilizers, minerals, and compost can help boost the value of your soil. Compost adds the living elements like microorganisms and beneficial insects. Fertilizers can bring up the mineral content up to where it needs to be to suit the plants that you're growing. I can tell you it's worthwhile to dig a little deeper and get to know those little guys in your soil that are working so hard. Believe me, when you get your soil right, your garden and your plants will thank you for it. When you run a farm, you soon find out that, well, there's a lot to do and there are a lot of moving parts, but it's very satisfying work. From seeing your first crop go from planted to harvest, to taking some eggs, hatching them, and raising your first flock of chickens, there's a lot that's very rewarding about farm life. Every moment is a learning experience, illustrating the beauty of the ebb and flow of the cycle of life. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith.